Hey everyone, my name is Lance, and this is Amped About Aimpad. For today's episode, I thought I would do something a little bit different and kind of go over the history of Aimpad. So, uh, I've been working on this Aimpad technology for a long time now, it's about seven years, more than seven years now, of how uh, I've been working and developing this technology, and I thought it might be interesting to you to see, like, where we started and like, kind of how we progressed through all these iterations until we finally got to where we are now. Um, so to start off, I wanted to show the very, very first prototype of Aimpad. So this is what the prototype looked like. Uh, basically, it consisted of an Xbox controller that was more or less hacked apart and then had a cable running out of it, running to this little pad that had pressure sensitive pads on it. So based off the amount of pressure that was applied to the key uh, would translate to some type of analog change and it basically replicated the stick of the aimpad uh, of the uh, Xbox controller and um, that was pretty much it. So the interesting things about this that we found off really right off the bat was that using pressure sensitivity was not very good. It wasn't just this, the layout being a weird shape, it was uh, having just a flat surface to apply pressure to is difficult to control, but the most difficult thing about it is that you have no way to tell if you're pushing hard enough. So you would be, you push down the key and it would kind of look like you might be running as fast or maybe driving as fast as you could, but you're applying a fair amount of pressure. And if you want to go faster, you have to push harder. You have to push harder and harder, but there's no distinct way to tell, like, am I going as fast as I possibly can, and I'm pushing this down as fast as I can, and you're just like cramming it down to like make sure you're going as fast as you can, and there's, there's no good feedback. You can have some visual feedback like, I think I'm going fast enough, but it's not distinct, it's not clear. So we thought that pressure sensitivity, despite like all the other things that going on with getting spacing for these keys and things like that might have been pretty tricky to get to, uh, to work, but uh, pressure sensitivity seemed to be pretty bad. So we scrapped that completely. Uh, the next aimpad prototype, we decided ultimately that infrared sensors was the best solution. So what we did was uh, we made this PCB that had the sensors mounted to the bottom and 3D printed these little keys that uh, actually are very smooth and very nice feeling. Um, and it actually worked pretty well. Like we were pretty excited to see how well the uh, response was. It was just a, a prototype just to see if these infrared things had potential. And I, at this point, they did. We, we felt pretty strong, like, this is the direction we need to go. So we stuck with this. Uh, obviously, some issues, it's super thick. Um, it's like almost two inches tall, and they're kind of really far separation. But I was able to use this and a mouse and everything and accomplish the task of, yep, this is, this is the direction we want to go. So, the next one was this guy. So this is the very first prototype that we like pep publicly showed to people. Um, and I first showed this to some of my friends just to see what they thought and they looked at it and were like, what the heck is that? Because it looks a little weird, right? It's, it's definitely, it's all 3D printed and um, looks a little strange and my friends were kind of like, what is this thing that you're doing? And so I kind of explained to them that, yeah, I mean, this is like an analog key. And like, what's an analog key? And you just have to explain more and more until they like, I had them try it. And they're like, oh, that's pretty cool. And so that was the point where I'm like, all right, things are progressing pretty well. Um, the nice things about this is this is the internals here. So this actually had all cherry switches. And it was around this time that we saw pretty clearly that mechanical switches were what people wanted like the cherry switches were becoming the in thing and gaming keyboards were kind of all progressing towards using mechanical switches um, and so we knew that we needed to do something that used cherry switches or some type of mechanical switch um, and so that's what we did we suppose we focused on on this prototype and this was the one that we tried to launch through kickstarter and obviously we did it way too way too early in the uh production process or iteration process um, the biggest issues that we had with this one is that uh, you can't really see it on this prototype, but you can kind of tell around here that there's this big giant gap around it. And the reason why is because it's actually the caps that we are measuring the distance based off of how far down you push the cap is how much you respond to analog movement. 
Um, the biggest problems with those is that the caps, kind of, there's like a, a fair amount of wobble on, on the switch. So unless you hit the, the thing like right in the middle um, or right at the bottom, it wasn't gonna provide a consistent performance. Like you could push it here and then like if you move your hand around, it uh, was not providing very consistent results. So we knew that this at least gave a visual impression that we're on the right track and it looks more like a keyboard. And we felt that this was maybe good enough to launch a Kickstarter, but we were totally wrong. <laughs> so we were in the process of reiterating that and we said, all right, we gotta get rid of that space. So this was the next iteration that we did. So this is um, actually two PCBs. So one PCB has just the cherry switches mounted to it and the other PCB has the sensors mounted to it. And we would kind of sandwich those together. And from all intents and purposes, this looked pretty similar to what a keyboard would look like, right? There's all cherry switches, space like cherry switches. Um, and we thought that this was, this was it. Like, this was what we're gonna go with. Um, so we actually took this to PAX East. This was the first one that we publicly demonstrated and had people publicly give their feedback. And the response was really, really good. Like, it, it was gratifying to me to know that this was something that people actually wanted. They were kind of interested in it and thought that there was a lot of potential here. Um, but there's a lot of things that we're doing wrong. So we went to Computex and tried to get some feedback from manufacturers that actually make uh, keyboards. This was about four years ago. And uh, one of the things that we were doing was with a cherry switch, we were actually drilling a hole through the bottom of the cherry switch. And all the manufacturers that make mechanical keyboards were like, no, you can't do that. Like, you can't have this be part of your process where you have to take a cherry switch and then set this up and then like drill through here and then go from that perspective. And they pretty much all just said, no, you, you can't do this because it's not going to, it's not gonna work from a manufacturer perspective. You're gonna have dust inside the switch, you're gonna get like, um, things from when you're soldering the switches that will get inside of it and compromise the integrity of the switch. And they didn't have very good confidence that the reliability was there. But um, this was when we had first made contact with Cooler Master. And they seemed really excited that this was something cool and interesting, but we needed to develop it more. Um, and we needed to overcome some of these issues. And and at this time, I was kind of a little deflated, like, we got so close to making this cool thing, but we just couldn't make it. Um, so we needed to think through, how can we make it easy to manufacture? What, what's, what's the burdens or what's the, the hurdles that we need to get over? And it was the, these cherry switches. The problem with this, the cherry switches is they're, they're just the solid black thing, and you can't see through the black thing with the light that we were using with our infrared sensors. And we were thinking like, well, what if we like mount the sensor inside the switch or, or try to think of some other, other ways. Maybe we're like gonna sense the, the spring resistance of, of the induction as, as you get the spring tighter and tighter and all sorts of things you're trying to come up with. And I was basically thinking through, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And I was kind of drifting off to sleep and we were just thinking about this whole process. And then I like woke up with a start and I remembered that Cherry was coming out with these MX RGB switches, the ones that, that have infrared light or that have uh, RGB lighting, and they were see-through. And I was like, "Yeah, it's obvious, right? You can see through it because the light comes out through the switch, and you can see the light through it. So what if we use the infrared light to look through the switch, and then use the exact same like lighting and the same functions to, to tell where that's the stem." is being located as, as you push it down. And so I got like super excited and like wrote down my ideas and thoughts and, and it's like, okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. So I, fortunately we made some contacts with Cherry at uh, Computex and I reached out to them and said, hey, I got this idea. I think we solved the problem if we can get some of the samples of those RGB switches. So they sent us some of those switches to test out and just to see what they were uh, capable of. So we went through some more iterations. I don't have the, the proto first prototype that we did with them, but uh, along the same lines, we were using a, a 
a full-size keyboard. We knew that this was the next iteration that we needed to do. We needed a full-size keyboard. So this is the first full-size keyboard that we produced and we had on the back was a second PCB. Uh, this one is still using the black stem switches. So uh, this is one that we took to uh, CES and gave our first demonstrations of it with a full keyboard and had some rudimentary firmware, but it was functional, it was there. But the next iteration was this guy. So what we decided to do was use a purple PCB because purple was looking pretty cool. Um, but we still used the two circuit boards. One was just the, the cherry switches and like the microcontroller and things like, things like that. And then the other one was a uh, second PCB that had the sensors mounted on it. But this time we're using the cherry switches. So these ones are the RGB ones. And basically you would take this and mount it onto here and that would uh, make a electrical connection with these connectors and that was a first like breakthrough of yes we can we can do this we can see through the switch and it works like this is it we're, we're good but we weren't good because we had the second PCB it was mounted here and it was mounted with these like pressure plates and it had a lot of like wobble in it. And if you like moved it around funny, it wasn't giving you consistent results. And we're like, crap, this the second PCB thing is like not gonna work. But we tried another thing. We're like, okay, well, what if we uh, do this castellated PCB where you attach the PCB directly to the other PCB and you can solder it directly to the circuit board. That should make it like pretty solid. And it was solid and it worked really well. And we were pretty excited about this one. But then we're like, well, we need to make it cheaper because a second PCB and a second uh, soldering process and uh, all this other stuff kind of adds to the cost. So we need to think through how are we going to make it cheaper? So that led us to some concepts. So we did a few little small circuit boards here and there uh, trying the concept of, well, what if we put the sensor directly through the bottom of the PCB and mount it directly on the bottom, and then you can see through the switch and have everything like in one circuit board. And this one was like the first one where I was like, yeah, we are, we are there. This is it. This is definitely it. So we made another full-size keyboard that uh, utilizes different uh, cherry switches that were the RGB ones. It was just an all single PCB. And it was at this moment I was like, I think we are there. We, we have the solution in place. But uh, it wasn't too terribly fancy. So uh, we went finally made the evolutionary leap to the uh, aimpad r5 this was the one that uh, I felt was like pretty much ready to be mass produced if we wanted to so this one had full RGB lighting on all of it it was the most complicated uh, PCB that our engineer Nikhil had uh, designed tons and tons of work went into making this thing and it was the culmination of having full RGB lighting on all the keys and making sure that, that we could do the, all the analog functions and everything was pretty much set. And this is the one that I think was able to finally convince Cooler Master that, yep, this is a legit thing that we want to uh, be a part of. So that's what ultimately led to this one, which is now the Cooler Master MK850 and has addressable RGB lighting and all sorts of other crazy stuff that does fully integrate with uh, with aimpad technology. So that whole iteration process of all of those different types of uh, different samples and different uh, prototypes took a long time to get right. And in retrospect, obviously the way we ended up with was the way to do it. But in the time that you're developing these things and trying to come up with concepts and, and ideas of what would work and what doesn't work, you have to fail like over and over and over and make choices that are bad just to learn that they're bad. And you don't know it until you try it. And, and I love this whole like developmental process of getting at the core of what is good and the core of what doesn't work and just trim off all that stuff that doesn't work and find the core of like what is awesome. 
and that, that's what this whole development process of developing aimpad has all been about. Um, so the question becomes, where do we go from here? So interesting enough, we started off aimpad trying to make this type of device, a device that is focused on a few keys that you might kind of stick to the, the left side of your keyboard and doesn't interfere with the normal stuff that you use, but have analog function here and then your mouse in the right hand. Um, and so that is actually the, the next product that Cooler Master and I are working on called the uh, Cooler Master Control Pad. Um, so I don't actually have a control pad here, but I will show you a, a web page that kind of identifies what's going on with it. And this week, we're planning on launching a Kickstarter to, to launch this. And you might be thinking, well, why are you doing a Kickstarter with Cooler Master? Why does Cooler Master need a Kickstarter? So the thing that we're trying to do with this product is, yes, it does do all the gaming stuff that I've loved and, and excited about, but we were trying to focus this product on who else can take advantage of analog keys outside of gaming. Not everyone's a gamer, it's unfortunate, but um, they have other uses for these analog keys that we haven't fully realized. Um, I have tons and tons of different ideas of ways that I want to do it and ways that I think can be uh, effectively leveraged as I've shown in, in previous videos, um, but I don't really know because I'm not in all those industries. I don't use certain programs on a daily basis, but there's people out there that might be interested in this product if we can say, what would you use these analog keys for? How would you use it? And use that information to help develop the product. So we want to reach out with, with uh, people that work in creative industries and movie industries and uh, broadcasting and audio and all sorts of different different uh, areas and get their, their feedback. So there's lots of areas such as things with the keycaps, like the design of the keycaps. What symbols do you want on there that mean something to you in your industry? We want to get at how would you be able to effectively layer certain functions. Right? You have one function here at the top and another function at the bottom and would it make sense to stack those types of functions? or would it make sense to have some type of analog control if you're trying to adjust the slider or a dial of some other tools that you use on a daily basis? Can these types of, of things be integrated into the same device? And I, I'm really, really excited about this. I think it's a, an, awesome, an awesome opportunity to make something that's unique, something that's focused, and I think that Kickstarter is not a bad idea to get that information. It's kind of a, a relatively risky venture to make this product that's kind of small, not a full-size keyboard, and it's focused on markets that Cooler Master just hasn't focused on in the past. So I think it makes sense. Um, hopefully you think it does too. If it's something that you think might be interesting to you, I would love if you would support the product uh, and the, the development of it. And I'm hoping that I can interact with you, you can interact with me, and we can make something that is like awesome. Like the way that I originally envisioned way back when we were making this first Kickstarter years ago, that this is the culmination of all the development to get to that step. So hopefully this uh, video has helped you a little bit to get, gain some insight into what it is that we're trying to do next. And uh, hopefully you uh, want some more. So if you do, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, otherwise, thank you for watching.